I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. And so in the opening verse, what is it that we see? Well, actually, we see a couple of things, don't we? The first thing we see concerns God the Father and his Son. We see God giving to his Son those he owns. And we see the Son making the Father known to those he's been given. The Father pointing to the Son. The Son pointing to the Father. You cannot think rightly of God outside of that framework. You just can't do it. To think you can worship God and exclude his Son is simply not possible, not from a, a New Testament perspective. So certainly not from God's perspective. To try to come to the Father without the Son revealing him to you is simply not possible. That's why Islam fails. That's why every religion that seeks to come into God's presence without coming through the Son ultimately fails. And not the Son as we might imagine him to be. There are a great many religions that will have you believe they're following Jesus. And it isn't Jesus they're following at all. Not the Son as we might imagine him to be, but as he truly is. That's why those many Australians who trust in their own goodness fail. She'll be right. I'll take my chances. I lived a good life. I loved my wife. I paid my taxes. I gave to the poor. All the while, church, and the person says that, all the while, Jesus is nowhere to be seen. All the while, what you hope in, really, if that is your hope, all the while, it's no hope at all. And that all changes, doesn't it, when you come to Jesus. When you, when you come to Jesus and when you seriously take the time to stop and to listen to him, he reveals to you who God is. Even though everyone belongs to God, those who do believe, they belong to God, and, and those who don't believe... Even though everyone belongs to God, it's only as a person comes to Jesus that they then discover who God is. You see, you cannot know God. You cannot know God unless you listen to the Son. But even if a person doesn't listen to the Son, even if a person doesn't listen to the Son, God owns them. Even if a person doesn't listen to the Son, God owns them. Ownership isn't subject to an individual's acceptance of Jesus. Accept Jesus. Re reject Jesus. Accept Jesus. Reject Jesus. It makes no difference. God owns you. God owns me. God owns Stephen Dawkins. God owns Xi Jinping. There is not a person alive, church, that he doesn't own. God owned Adam before he ate the fruit and, and God owns Adam after he ate the fruit. God owns me if I know him. God owns me if I don't know him. God owns me, church, if I honour him. God owns me if I don't. God owns me if I follow him. God owns me if I don't follow him. Whatever you believe and whoever you follow, God owns you. And as the one who owns us, pre presents us to his son, as he, as he gives us to his son, as we, as we hear the gospel and as we believe the gospel, God's son makes known to us the Father. He makes known to us the one in whose hands we sit. How then does he reveal to us his Father? Well, let's think about that for a moment. It's through the Son, it's through Jesus that we see the Father's love. Now, sometimes our experience, we've spoken about this before, sometimes 
our experience, your experience and, and my experience, tells us the exact opposite, doesn't it? Our experience tells us, sometimes it shouts at us, that God doesn't love us. And as we come to his son, we see very clearly that we are loved. As we come to his son, we see that the father does love us. The son he, he loves, the one he has loved for all eternity, the father gave him up for us. God loves us. God loves us deeply, profoundly, profoundly, for all the world to see at great personal cost. He loves us. God loves the world, his world, and because he loves it, he hasn't abandoned it. He doesn't give it up. But that's not all we see, is it? Through the Son, through, through Jesus, we see the Father's holiness. We, we see his grace. We, we see his faithfulness. We see God's, God's love and, and God's holiness, his, his grace and his faithfulness, all revealed, all made known. How? Through his Son. So that Jesus reveals to us the heart of the invisible, otherwise altogether unknowable God. The, the God who is hidden because of our sin, Jesus reveals. And so unless we come to him through his son, the one who reveals him to us, the best that we can do, the best that anyone can do really is, is guess. The best that we can do. The very best that we can do is imagine what God must be like. As we look at his creation, we, well, we can see aspects of him, can't we? We see that he is a powerful God. We see as we look at his creation that he is a God of diversity. We also see something of his glory, but, but he remains somehow hidden. As we look at creation, it's, it's not altogether clear. It's as Rod shared last week, as Bandit. Bandit is the father of Bluey and Bingo in a children's cartoon, and I had to go and make sure I got the names right, Rod. Bingo, Bluey. As Bandit looks a little more closely at creation, he sees something altogether wonderful. He sees something that is mysterious. But for Bandit, as mesmerising and as captivating as it is, that's where it ends. That's where it ends. And just like Bandit, so much of the world is ignorant of the one who is behind all of the diversity. Who is the one behind the power? Who is the one behind all of the glory? It gets us part of the way, but, but creation doesn't get us all of the way. We, we can't quite see who's behind it. We are still wondering, who is the one behind the diversity? Who, who is the one behind all of the power and the, and the glory? And men like Darwin and Dawkins and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, they tell us that there's no one behind it. That what we see, church, is power for power's sake and diversity for diversity's sake and even, if you would believe it, glory for glory's sake. No reason, no design, no purpose. And it's only when we come to Jesus that we see clearly, clearly who God is. Powerful and, and, and desiring of diversity and glorious, all of that, but also, church, also compassionate. When we come to, come to Jesus, we see that he is a compassionate God. When we, when we come to Jesus, we see that he is a forgiving God. When we come to his son, we see that he is the God who is faithful. Faithful to all of his promises. That this otherwise unknowable God, this hidden God, that he has made himself known. And that all who bow at the feet of his son 
Everyone who bows at the feet of his son need not fear judgment. And so that's the first thing we see. You cannot know the Father, not in, not in all of his fullness, unless the Son reveals him to you. And you do not belong to the Son unless the Father gives him uh, or gives you to him. We cannot separate them. They're always together. The Father and the Son always working for our own good. And the second thing we see is the obedience of those given by the Father to the Son. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. <coughs> now obedience, obedience is a word a great many Christians don't quite know what to do with. And perhaps there's some Christians, some followers of Jesus in this congregation, and they don't know quite what to do with that word. Jesus often uses it. But, but, but somehow the word obedience tends to unsettle us. Not, not all of us, but, but some of us. We struggle sometimes to, to hold our knowledge of the love of God in all of its many facets and, and God's call for his people to be obedient in the necessary tension that the Bible presents it. And so we rightly marvel at the wonder of God's love, the way perhaps that Paul marveled at it. What a, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so in recognising God's love in Jesus Christ, Paul gives up all of his, his futile efforts, doesn't he? he? He gives it all up. Instead, what does Paul do? Instead, Paul now clings to God's mercy, the mercy that has been made available to him through Jesus Christ. Paul has come to recognise that no amount of effort on his part will win God's favour. And so what does Paul do? Well, Paul rejects it, doesn't he? He, re he rejects it all. And the moment he gives it up, he finds rest. He finds the peace that he was looking for. And then, church, then, and then begins a journey, a life of obedience as he follows God's son. Now he wants to please God. And so he follows the son in whom the father is well pleased. And we sometimes think to ourselves, don't we, that, that if God loves me unconditionally, then, then what place does obedience have? Well, I think sometimes we think to ourselves, it, it's nice... It's nice if I'm obedient. It's even good if I'm obedient. We reason to ourselves that because God loves me unconditionally, obedience is a nice to have. It's a nice to have. It's not a must have. Paul doesn't support that view. Jesus doesn't support that view. The reason the 11 are still with him, unlike Judas, is because they are obedient. God declared, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Church, there's their obedience. There's their obedience right there. It's why Judas is no longer one of them. Judas wouldn't listen. He, he listened to other voices. He listened to, to louder voices. He listened to voices that gave to him what he wanted. He listened, church, to his own voice. Not so the eleven. They are obedient. They, they have listened, just as Paul listened. And as the end draws near, as the cross looms large, they continue to listen. They don't always understand... They don't always get it right, but they listen. They desire to be obedient. And, and, and so what do they do? Well, they listen. They sit at his feet. They shut out all, shut out all of the, the competing voices and they listen to him. 
And so rather than use a term we never once see in Scripture to, 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 to describe God's love, maybe we should begin to think a little bit differently. Rather than speak of God's unconditional love, perhaps we should speak of God's unfailing love. Perhaps we should speak of God's uncompromising love. But perhaps we should start to speak of God's redeeming love or God's persistent love, his transforming love. And church, because of his transforming love, once we were disobedient, now we're obedient. Not obedient to earn God's love, obedient because of God's love. That the potter can take a lump of clay and, and shape it into something altogether wonderful and altogether useful and, and altogether glorious, fit for purpose, fit church for a king. That's why he transforms us, so that we will be fit for a king. Jesus was obedient and he calls his followers to also be obedient. Why because he loves us and we, church, we love him. We love him. Now they know, says Jesus in verse 7. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They know with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. There it is again. Did you, did, did you hear him? Did you hear what it was that Jesus says? Jesus gives to us his word. He, he gives to us his word and we either accept his word or we don't. But we either accept his word or we, or we don't. We either believe his word or we don't. We're either obedient to his word or we're not. There's no half measures. There's a great many things that his disciples don't yet understand. They don't yet understand why Jesus has to leave them. They don't yet understand why he has to die. They don't yet understand a great many things. And we've seen that, haven't we, over the course of the previous 15 chapters. But church, there's one thing, there's one thing that the disciples do know. What then do they know? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 8. They know with certainty that Jesus came from God and they believe that God sent him. They know that. Now the question why, church, the question why will be asked by every single person in this room before they die a thousand times, a hundred thousand times. Every one of us is going to ask that question, why? A great many questions are going to fill our head. Why is this happening to me? When will it end? How much longer will this last? And try as you may, you won't find answers to a whole lot of the questions that you ask. And you'll come to me, and you'll come to Rod, and you'll, you'll come to Glenn and, and Stephen too, and you'll ask us. You'll ask a great many people. And as you come to us, some of those questions we'll answer, and, and some of those questions... We won't. But church, what you do know, what you, what you do know will make all of the difference in the world. Because what you know is the truth concerning Jesus. You know. You know, church, that he holds you. You know, church, despite the, the thousand questions that that swirl around in your head, you know that Jesus has won the victory. You know, church, that no matter how hard it gets, Jesus will one day make sense of it all. You'll see how it was that he shielded you as you were asking those questions. And you'll see how it was that he kept you for himself. And if that's what you know, church, if that's what you know, if that's all you know, then no hurdle is ever going to be too big. No problem that you face 
will ever be insurmountable. No problem. Now that's true. No problem that you face, no problem that I face, will be bigger than the God who holds us. And not only does does he hold us, not only does he hold us, but listen to this. He prays for us. Listen to Jesus in verses 9 and 10. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. All I have is yours. And all you have, says Jesus, is mine. Now just stop for a moment. Just take a moment to think about that. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Don Carson points out, that's not something that an ordinary man can pray. It's not something that an ordinary man can pray. A man might pray, all I have is yours. A teacher might pray, all I have is yours. Muhammad might pray, all I have is yours. Gandhi might pray, all I have is yours. But only God can pray, all you have is mine. Church, when you place your life in the hands of Jesus, you know whose hands you are resting in? God's hands. That's whose hands you are resting in. Never forget that. Never for a moment doubt that. Don't allow the world to convince you that Jesus is no different. Jesus is a man, but he's not just a man. Who is he? He's nothing less than God himself. And what is it that this God-man does? Well, he prays. Jesus prays for those who are his. Now, what does that tell us? Think about it. Jesus is about to depart, and what does he do? He prays for those who are his. Now, I'm sure there are times when Jesus prayed for those who are not his, that they would come to him, that they would step out of the darkness and into the light. I'm sure there were, there were many occasions when Jesus prayed that kind of prayer. But here Jesus prays for those who, in obedience, in, in trusting, selfless obedience, faithfully now follow him. For those who, because they follow him, the world will despise. And so what does Jesus do? He prays for them. And what that tells us, church, is that prayer is powerful. What that tells us is that prayer is powerful. You see, see, Jesus doesn't pray here to fill in time. How often is it that we do that? We pray to fill in time. Jesus doesn't pray to, to fill in time. Jesus doesn't pray because he's got nothing better to do. No, no. Jesus prays, church, because prayer is effective. Prayer places our need in the hands of the Father. At the very least, church, he's setting for his disciples an example. When you really do love someone, what's the best you can do for them? When you really do love someone, the very best that you can do for them is to pray for them. Pray for them before they face the world, before the world attacks them, before their world begins to fall apart. That's what Jesus does, isn't it? They don't know what's around the corner, but Jesus does. And so what does he do? He, he prays for them. But not only pray for them before their their world falls apart, pray for them when the road ahead is uncertain and filled with questions that those you love just don't have answers to. Pray for them then too. Why pray for them? Pray for them because prayer is powerful. Prayer, in other words, is, is not a resource that we turn to when everything else fails. 
No, no, no. Prayer is something that we turn to because God never fails. That's why we turn to prayer. We turn to prayer because the one we pray to never fails. We fail. You fail and I fail, but God never fails. And so if you're carrying a burden this morning, can I just encourage you to, to think about sharing it with someone and ask them to pray for you. Ask them to, to pray with you. And if you are carrying a burden this morning, why not take hold of the opportunity to come to the front at the end of the service and there'll be a brother or a sister here waiting for you for that very purpose, to pray with you and to pray for you. Why? Because prayer is powerful. It's not something that we do to fill in time. It's powerful. It's powerful. Why is it powerful? It's powerful because God never fails. And so Jesus, knowing how difficult the coming hours and days will be for those he loves, what does he do? He, he prays for them. And so what is it exactly that Jesus prays for? Well, John tells us, doesn't he, in verse 11. I will remain in the world no longer, says Jesus, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And so what is it that Jesus prays for? He's just about to be arrested. He's just about to be tried and found guilty of a crime he hasn't committed. He's just about to be nailed to a cross. And what is it that Jesus prays for? Well, he prays for their protection. And secondly, he prays that, though, that they may be one as Jesus and the Father are one. Actually, it's not, it's not two prayers at all. It is one prayer. The protection Jesus prays for is that nothing will divide them. Jesus prays that they will be one, that those God has brought together, no one and nothing will divide. Just as nothing in all of eternity has come between the Father and the Son, so too Jesus prays that nothing will come between those who follow him. And the great tragedy, church, is that left to ourselves, that is precisely what will often happen and, and so often does happen. And notice that Jesus doesn't pray that they be made one. In Christ they are one. We, church, we are one. And Jesus prays that they remain that way, that, that nothing come in that would divide us, that his Father would protect us, that we would be awake, each one of us, to the devil's schemes, that we would be aware of those things that cause division. What things? Well, let's start with pride. Pride causes divisions. What about worldly wisdom? Worldly wisdom causes divisions. Putting me first rather than Christ first. Putting me before my brothers and sisters. My need before their need. My time before their time. Thinking church as the world thinks. Behaving as the world behaves. Living for self rather than dying to self. Listen. A united church... That is a church that is united in purpose, a church that is united in truth, a church that is united in its mission, a church like that really will be like a city on a hill. The world will see its light. In verse 12, Jesus reminds his disciples of who it was that protected them for the three years they followed him. How was it that they stayed together? How was it that they remained a united group? How was it that all of the opposition that came against them didn't scatter them? How? Well, Jesus, listen to him. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. By that name you gave me, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. While I was with them, I protected them. 
says Jesus. And the implications, church, the implications for us, for those who today follow him, I think are obvious. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus and nothing will harm you. Stay close to Jesus and nothing will end in disunity. Drift and all bets are off. Follow a different voice, a different wisdom and things begin to change. Certainty is replaced by uncertainty. Unity is replaced by disunity. Hope for the future is inevitably replaced by doubts. So determine, church, as best as you can, determine not to let that happen to you. Determine, church, to stay close to Jesus. Listen to him. Be led by his spirit. Read his word. Trust and obey. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for the faithfulness of your Son, that he stands with us and by us, that he guides us and that all we need to do is stay close to him. Lord, my prayer for your people in this place is indeed they and we would stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer for this church is that we be like a light on a hill that shines brightly into the darkness and that people in the darkness might see that light and be drawn to you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.